Fight Hall, 1212. For the first time in its history, Scotland Yard opens its official files to bring you the true stories of some of its most baffling cases. These are the true stories. The plain, unvarnished facts, just as they occurred, reenacted for you by an all British cast. Only the names of the participants have, for obvious reasons, been changed. The broadcasts are presented for the full cooperation of Scotland Yard. Research for Whitehall 1212 is from Percy Hoskins, chief crime reporter of the London Daily Express. The stories for radio are written and directed by Willis Cooper. Here is Chief Superintendent John Davidson of Scotland Yard, custodian of the famous Black Museum. The exhibit I have to show you today from our Black Museum files is neither more nor less unusual than anything I've shown you. But, like many other of these intrinsically unusual objects, it has acquired a certain interest because of its association. Now, you've seen thousands of these. It's a string of very colored plastic beads made by cutting plastic tubes of various colors into short lengths and stringing them together to form a woman's necklace. The string has been broken, but it's been retied, you see. The man who tied it together is here beside me. He was in charge of the case number 696966. This is Detective Inspector Herbert Case of the CID. Herbert? This case is one of the few in which the press was able to be of considerable assistance to us. Not, I assure you, by usurping the functions of the police, as so many fictional newspaper men do so fictionally successfully, but... By passing on to us with remarkable celerity everything they discovered and leaving the dirty work to us whose job that is. I applaud such pressmen as does every good policeman. On the 9th of August last year, the Criminal Investigation Department of Nottingham received a trunk telephone call from London. The call was routed to me. The caller identified himself. John Marchbanks, Inspector Case here, Mr. Marchbanks. Yes, sir. A man's just called to tell me that he is willing to sell me for a considerable sum of money the exclusive first hand story of a murder. Uh, may I ask who you are, sir? Oh, oh sorry. Yes, I'm the editor of the News of the World in London. Uh, we've large circulation in you know. I've seen your papers. That's very good of you, sir. Did the man give his name? Uh, yes. I told him I'd have to consult my superiors, and I ring him back at 1225. He's at the telephone kiosk there, and the number 633191. And his name? Brown. George Brown, is it? Although I suspect that rather too easy, isn't it? Probably his nom de blue. Are you going to talk to him at that number, sir? At 1225, I told him. Yes. Thank you, sir. We'll be there with him. Goodbye. It was, of course, simple to determine the location of the telephone kiosk from the number. I proceeded there at once to Detective Sergeant Victor Mann. To find a young man with excessively long hair talking rapidly into the phone, we moved closer to listen as best we might through the closed door. Now, nobody knows about it except... Victor. Did you say that, sir, Inspector? At what fate is... I you expect you'd better find out, Sergeant. All right, sir. Well, a hundred and fifty pounds. I need them. Your name, George Brown. Excuse me, listen. I'll have that telephone, please. <laughs> Look here, who are you? Your D cop. Give us the phone. Hello, hello. Are you there? Hang on a sec, please. This is the police. You want to talk, Inspector? I, I say. Are you George Brown? I am. I, I was. It's him, Inspector. Thank you. Just wait, you Brown. Hello, is that Mr. Marshbank? It is. Good. Was that your man? Right, we're here. We'll have a talk with him. 
Eh? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Of course, I'll remember. Thanks very much, sir. Now, Mr. Brown. Who are you, the police? We are. What's the our cards? I was going to call you at once, officer, just as soon as I got finished with my London call. Well, I suppose you tell us now. You're right here. May I sit down, please? On the bench, sir. Leg feels better when I sit down. What was your leg? Always been that way. Uh, sit down, Sergeant. Now, what's this, Brown, about the murder you know about? Well, I, I don't know if it's a murder or not, sir. You told the editor of the News of the World it's a murder. Well, I think it's a murder. Where? It's in an old derelict orchard about half a mile from here, sir. It's a woman, you told the editor? Yes, sir, a woman. Is the body still there? Yes, sir. I'm sure nobody would find it. Why hasn't it been reported to the police? Well, I found it just yesterday, you see, and I thought I'd try to make some money out of it before I told you chaps. Can't blame me for that, you know. Well, can't we? Do you want to take us there? Well, under the circumstances, sir, I suppose there's really no choice, is there? There is not. <clears throat> Come along. I'm on my leg, will you, you great oaf? I felt... Sorry for young George Brown as he limped along with us in the direction of his derelict orchard. Down Edwards Lane, past the Roxy Cinema and the Metropole Hotel, jabbering about his bad luck at every step. How'd you chaps get on with me? I'd have stood to make 250 pounds if you hadn't butted in. 150, the bloke on the telephone was saying to you. All you were saying to him, Cock. Well, I'm in the office now, you know, until a fellow's out of work. Now I shall never see it, thanks to you. So you're right, trying to make fools of the police. Oh, it didn't make fools of you, mate. Don't come at Gracie Fields on us. How much further is this place, Brown? Down the hill there. There's a park. I don't see a park. You'd never have found it. I'll show you. Here, see? It's all grown over, but there's your path. Where's this body? See down there, at the bottom? Yeah, that's that pile of rags? It's a coat. Been thrown over. Who threw it over? How do I know? The murderer, very likely. How do you find her? I saw beads lying on the path here. Oh, I'd better give them to you, hadn't I? You had. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot them. Here. Hmm. Better time together, haven't I? How do you know they're hers? I don't know. Seems probable, though, don't it? Yes, it. What can't... Oh, I'm not going down there again. I've seen her. Now, come on, pal. No, I won't do it. It was tough enough climbing up and down yesterday with my leg. I'll stay here. You go on. Too right, you'll stay here. Shall I climb down, sir? I'll go. You stay here with a prisoner. Prisoner? I'm, I'm not arrested, am I? You are now. I arrest you on charge of willfully concealing evidence of a violent death, and I warn you that anything you say will be taken out of writing and may be used in evidence. That is for you, Cook. What are you going to do with me? The body was that of a woman about 30, I judge, lying on her side, fully dressed, the coat carefully placed over her. There was no immediate means of identification, and the only obvious wounds were the bruises about the head, which had caused the face to become quite black. The body was removed to the mortuary at Leanside for examination by Dr. Croft and the police surgeon, and by Dr. John Little of the Home Office Forensic Science Laboratory. Man and I took Brown to a justice of the peace on the charge we had made of concealing evidence. He was allowed to go after he'd been bailed under the Criminal Justice Act of 1925, which permits the police to go bail themselves in such cases. In the meantime, a card found in a pocket of the coat which had covered the body had provided the first identification. The card bore the name of Mrs. Ann Battersby of 97 Longmead Drive, Nottingham, who had been reported missing on Friday the 3rd of August, six days earlier. Lodgers at the Longmead Drive address identified the broken string of beads, the coat itself, and certain other articles as the missing Mrs. Battersby's. I talked with Sergeant Mann. Yes, sir. That's who it was, all right. This Battersby woman. Body's been identified. Who identified her? Uh, her husband and these other people, sir. What about her husband? Oh, I I've talked to him, sir. Are you all right? Well, I brought him along with me, sir. 
Is he here now? Yes, sir. Let's have a look at him. All right, sir. Mr. Bathurst, please. Yes. Come in, please. Inspector Case, Mr. Bathurst, please. Sit down. Sit down, Mr. Bathurst. I was wondering if you can tell us anything, sir. I tried to, sir. I can't imagine. Your wife's acquaintances, is, is there anyone at all? I don't know of any. The ones I know are other women. No woman did that, Inspector. No. How do you account for her being found in that particular place, Mr. Bavisson? I don't know. That near the Roxy Cinema. That's where she was going when she left. She told Tommy. Tommy? Thomasina Jane, our daughter. She was home when Anne left. Where were you, Mr. Bavisson? At work. What's your occupation? Advertising copywriter. For an advertising firm? No, I'm self-employed. My office is in St. Peter's Gate. I see. And when did you discover your wife missing on the third? She wasn't there when I came home. At ten o'clock at night, I notified the police at once. What time did you leave your office? At about nine thirty. I see. Is that your usual leaving time, sir? <sighs> no. What is your usual time? About half past five. Uh huh. I was working that night on a, a new advertising Are you, campaign. You could prove that, of course. I'm afraid I can't. I was alone. I, I had no office employees, and I was I was quite startled when I realized how late it had got, and I hurried When home. you found your wife absent, where did you think she was? I, I, I didn't know. Tommy woke and said she'd gone to the cinema. I telephoned there, but there was no answer, and I called several of her friends. Women friends? Of course. Well, only one of them was at home. Danny out of pre, and she was... Uh, what, what did you expect to find out, Mr. Embarrassy? Why, poor Anne used once in a while to stay the night, Danny out of Without leaving you a message? Well, I, I thought you'd forgotten to call Tommy, or perhaps Tommy had been asleep and hadn't heard the telephone. But your wife was not there? No. Danny out said she'd seen her that afternoon. Where? Near the Roxy Cinema, about four o'clock. And where were you at that time? I was... In my office, working. Where you stayed all evening. Of course. Going without your dinner. I'm afraid so. But that you can't prove. Can you? Look here, are you accusing me of my wife's death? Not yet, sir. Now, let me tell you what Dr. Little, the home office pathologist, said to me. I called on him the next morning, the 9th, at his laboratory, where the body had been taken for a more complete examination. He'd been working most of the night, and he was tired. Oh. Well, I've discovered several things, Herbert. Any progress? I let you decide. First, she'd been dead for about a week. That was the bruises on her face, which I think were made by someone's fist to counsel the dark color of her skin. Almost black. Yes. She was murdered about the time she disappeared then. Hmm? I think I can say so. How quickly did the discoloration set in? Almost at once. A day or so, so let's say. Oh, I can keep my eyes open. I'm sorry. It's my job. Second, she died of strangulation. Suffocation. I think, remembering the bruises, it was man manual strangulation. Yeah. By the condition of the stomach contents, she died about four hours after her last meal. Huh. If we can discover when she ate last, then we'll know almost the exact time of her death. The day and the time. I'll try to find that out. All right. Now, we use my little laboratory vacuum cleaner on her clothes. What did you find? Nothing much. Except these hairs. Longish. Black? Yes. Recognize them? And on her husband, he's almost bald-headed. What hair he has is sandy. Traces of grief on this. Can it be identified? You suppose? I doubt it. But we can compare it with samples of brill cream and other methods people put on their hair and identify it that far. Will you do that? Of course. Probably a murderer. I'm sure. Well, here. This is what we found under her fingernails. Oh, More hair? Shreds of fiber. From her coat or dress? From somebody else's coat or dress. You think another woman, Doctor? Can't tell. Bring me the garment she clawed these bits from, and I'll prove that's what they're from. 
Oh. Some cows and microscope, my boy. Oh. I'd like to see those bees you were talking about, too. Sorry. What for? I want to see if they fit into these marks in her neck. Marks? I think the boy will strangled her with her own bead. So do you mind sitting out and letting me get a few inches of sleep like a good man? Are you going to sleep here? Well, the lady won't. The <sighs> Leaving Dr. Little to his well-earned rest, I sought out Sergeant Mann for a conference. He listened attentively to my instructions. All right, sir. <clears throat> I've got it all, I think. The beads. they are taken to Dr. Little. Right. That is it. Ask him for samples of his hair. What else? Uh, look over his wardrobe and get samples of fibers from everything and bring them to the four scenic laboratory. Oh, yes. And, and find out from him how to reach the Stanil du Pure. <laughs> I... I admire your pronunciation, Sergeant. Well, uh, the girlfriend of Mrs. Battersby. And ask her to come and see me. Ask her? Petra. Hope she's pretty. She's handsome. Uh, honest war, he nearly pulls. <laughs> what? Uh, French, you will speak it like a native. Well, try it on Mademoiselle Dupuis. Try what, sir? <laughs> Get out of here. Send in that man that's waiting. Man, sir? The newspaper fellow. Oh, the little fat man from London. Send him in. Yes, sir. You can come in, sir. Oh, thank you. Excuse me. I'm addressing Inspector Case, am I not? You are, sir. I take it you're Mr. Marshbank. Well, off the news of the world, London. I was speaking to you yesterday, sir. Very glad to see you, sir. Oh, thank you. May I sit down? By all means. Well... You uncovered a real one, Mr. Marshbanks. What brings you to Nottingham? I came down to see this murder story merchant, Brown. He telephoned me again last night. Oh, did he? Hmm. Tell me that you've arrested him. I'll teach him to conceal evidence. He's on bail now, but he'll get sent down for a few months and his trial comes up. What did he tell you? Tell me? When he telephoned you. Oh, uh, well, I promised to give him 70 pounds for his story... Uh, provided you have no objections. It's our type of thing, after all, you know. I'm down his price, isn't it? No, that, that was my doing. We're not in business for our health, you know. <laughs> it's all right with you. Provided, of course, that I show you the story first. I see no harm in it as well. Oh, good, good. Uh, thank you. Ordinarily, I bet our staff man here in Nottingham handle it, but I wanted to get away from a desk, and uh, I confess this intrigues me. Yeah. I say, I was thinking of something. <laughs> Can't put down an old newspaper man and you're comfortable. Inspector. Huh? Oh, I am sorry. Of course, Inspector. <laughs> That's many bloody things about constables in the paper, you know. I, oh, I am sorry. Do forgive me. What are you thinking of? Oh, I was just thinking, what if this young chap turns out to be the murderer himself? Wouldn't that be jolly? Would be quite interesting, Mr. Marshbanks. I know what I should do. What? I should give him an extra 50 pounds. But only if his story is exclusive, sir. Only if it's exclusive, mind you. You're very generous, sir. It'll be worth it. Oh, it'll be worth it. Well, sir, if I allow you to leave me upon your lawful occasions now, I trust you will leave me to mine. Huh? I shall see you again before the day is over, sir. Oh, with my exclusive story, I promise you, sir. <laughs> Good morning. Before the day was over, uh, I'd said, a great many things happened before that day was over. First at about three in the afternoon, Dr. Little telephoned me from his forensic laboratory. Well, I had a good sleep, Chase. Well, I'm glad to hear that, sir. This is about an hour ago, and your sergeant man brought him samples from him, Mr. Battersby's clothing. He sent for them. He sent them for them, he said. All right. I checked about half of them. They don't match the samples under her fingernails. Oh, they don't. Sergeant Mann brought a sample of that. More like a 
Well, I expect as much. Good, thank you. I'll be here. As I sat down the telephone, there was a knock on the door. Yes? Come in. You need all this. Thank you, Sergeant. It is uh, the Inspector Case, n'est-ce pas? I am the Inspector Case, yes, sir. This is Mademoiselle Dupuis, sir. Uh, Danielle Dupuis. Oh. I'd like to ask you a few questions, please, Mr. Dupuis. Uh, the sergeant man. Man? No. No, he has already asked me questions, monsieur. What have you been asking her, ma'am? Oh, not about the case, sir. <laughs> not, uh, I mean, uh... He asked me, do I know Anne Battelby? Yes, I say, and I do not. She's dead. Oh, he laughs, my poor Annie. You saw on the day she disappeared. Oh, I see her two times. Twice? I see her twice. Which? Twice. Once, when she is about for to leave for the cinema. The Roxy to see une lettre pour trois épouses. A letter for three wives. But I am making luncheon for me and my friend. And I am desolate I cannot go with her. Oh! What's the matter? Oh, I just think if I go with her, I am dead too. Oh, well, cheer up, Mr. Pui. Uh, Pui, you didn't go with it. <coughs> Excuse me, sir. So what did you do then, please, Mr. Pui? Uh, I give her my lunch with my friend. Uh, haricot vert. Uh, she means green bean. At what time? Huh? Oh, uh, 15 hours. Pourquoi? Wait, wait just a second. Put me through to Dr. Little at the forensic laboratory. Doctor. Who is it? Herbert Case. Nothing new yet, Case. Look, I found when Mrs. Battersby had her last meal. Uh-huh. When? At three o'clock on the third. Do you know what she ate? Green beans, for one thing. For now, thank you. Bye. And when was the other time you saw Mrs. Battersby that day, Miss Dupuis? It was about uh, just before five minutes to six. Uh, uh, where, uh, Miss Dupuis? Uh, hold it, hold it, Sergeant. Are you sure of the time, Miss Dupuis? I am always sure, Monsieur the Inspector, and it was on Edward's Lane, only just past the Roxy Cinema. And of that I am also certain. Did you talk to her? I did not. How am I to know who is this man she is talking with? Man. She is walking down the street, Edward's Lane, toward the old orchard with a man, and he is talking to her. Would you recognize this man again, Mr. Priest? Oh, I am not sure I would know his face for sure. Did he have a lame leg? How do you know that? Did he? Why? I wish you had asked Mrs. Battersby to go with you. But I could not, monsieur... I had a very important appointment. Why do you wish so? Because I think you saw the man who murdered her about half an hour later. <gasps> and that wasn't all that happened before the day was over. I turned Mr. Puy over to the matron who applied cold cloth to her head. Fifty minutes later, Marsh Banks of the News of the World returned and came cheerfully into my office. It's wonderful. What's wonderful? The story. Brown story? Is it written already? I've got the first paragraph here. As soon as we've looked it over, we're going over to the Black Boy Hotel. I have a room there, and he's going to finish it on my portable typewriter. <laughs> Never traveled without the portable? Made in Switzerland, you know. Used by correspondents everywhere. May I see the story? Of course. Wonderful idea. He calls it, I Saw Something White. Isn't that a ripping title? What's it mean? Well, let me read it. As I slowly walked up the rustic path in the derelict orchard, I saw something white on the path before me. What could this be taste through, uh, raced through my mind? I hurried forward and bent over the white object, and my heart almost stopped. It was the white face of a dead woman. That's enough. I uh, don't want to hear the rest of it. No, I want to hear the rest of it from Brown. Oh, how fortunate. I asked him to wait for me in the end room. Isn't it? Now, just a second. Sergeant Mann, get Miss Dupuy and ask her to come to the ante room at once. Fetch her if she has any objections. Yes, Miss Dupuy? I think Mr. Brown has met her. Oh, 
French, eh? Come on, let's find Brown. Oh, uh, do you happen to have an extra 50 pounds on you, Mr. Mustang? 50 pounds? I think you're going to owe it to Mr. Brown. Eh? Your proposition, you remember. Come on. my story? The first paragraph, I mean. I found it very interesting. I, I like it very much indeed. Well, thank you. You said you saw her white face. Well, I thought that it was rather a good touch. It was if you'd seen her face within an hour or two after you'd killed her. <laughs> what are you saying? The combination of the blows she had received in the face and the strangling with her beads and the hot weather. Her face has been that ghastly black color since a few hours after she died. George Brown. Black. Black, that's what I meant. Smart Black. I... Oh, here you are, Mr. Queen. Have you ever seen this man before? Oh! It is he. It is the man with the lint. Yes, I have seen him. He is the man who did kill her. Oh, I'm not sorry. And this time the warning was a trifle different from the first time. George Brown, I arrest you for the willful murder of Anne Battersby. I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. This is a little of the testimony of George Brown at the Knotts Assizes when he was tried for murder. Yes, I killed her. No, there was no reason for it, no reason except I hate everyone. Everyone hates me and my crippled leg. I'm glad I thought so many times about a perfect crime. She laughed at me once as I dragged my way down Edward's lane. I promised myself she'd be the first to die, and after I'd murder her, I'd seek out the others who laughed at the poor cripple. So I, I asked her to help me over the road in the rough orchard. She laughed, and she said about Harry... She didn't know she was going to die. I hate her. I hate you. I hate everybody. The crime if I hadn't tried to make money for the races out of it. Should have been satisfied with her life. Strangling the lots and smiles out of her with her own paltry bead. I hate her. I hate her. There was a great deal of that. He was found guilty, but they didn't hang him. He was sent to the asylum for criminal insane at Broadmoor. He hanged himself five months later. Poor demented boy. Heard on Whitehall 1212 today, Horace Bram as Inspector Case. Others in the order of their appearance were Harvey Hayes, Maurice Delamore, Carl Harbord, Lester Fletcher, Glenn Farmer, Gerard Burke, and Patricia Courtley. Lionel Rico speaking. Whitehall 1212 is written and directed by Willis Cooper.